My name is Sunshine Menezes. I'm the Executive Director of Metcalf Institute, and we're pleased to welcome you all to this webinar as part of our Climate Change in the News webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Radley Horton, who is a Lamont Associate Research Professor at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. He studies climate change impacts, especially related to climate extremes and also climate adaptation. He's done a lot of work in that regard, and you're going to hear today um, about some of the work that he's been involved with with the new U.S. Global Change Research Program Climate Change Science Special Report. Um, so with that, I'll get started, if that's all right. So um, thanks, everybody, for um, uh, calling in, listening in during this busy um, time of year. I have about 15 or 20 slides I'd like to run through. I'll try to go fairly quickly, just hitting on um, a few of the highlights um, from this climate science special report. I'll talk a little bit about the process that led to its uh, creation. And hopefully we'll have uh, you know, a solid 15 minutes or so at least um, uh, for your questions and comments, which I'm really looking forward to. So um, before I jump into this, I should say that I'm uh, of course, indebted to a whole bunch of people. As I'll, as I'll discuss later, there was a huge author team on this report. It really represents um, uh, federal science in action in, in many ways. The majority of the, of the uh, contributors, whether it's the data, the modeling, or the people who actually wrote the report, um, were within um, uh, the federal government um, in a, on a more sort of um, uh, prosaic level. The, the specific slides that I'm showing today um, uh, were largely created by others, especially um, Catherine Hayhoe created a lot of these slides. Some of them were, some of them were created by USGCRP um, as well. So with that, I will um, jump in. Does everybody see slide two? Hopefully. So before we actually talk about the report, I think it's, I think it's important to remind ourselves something that I'm sure a lot of you have more expertise on than I that um, when we think about climate science um, and people's perception of, of climate science, um, whether, it's, whether it's a major issue or not, this isn't solely an is issue of what's referred to as sort of information deficit. Um, there are many things that go into people's perception of climate science. Um, and I think this quote from, from Catherine gets at some of these issues. If someone's already not on board with climate science or is just disengaged and feels like it doesn't matter, more information about, say, ocean acidification or attribution of extreme weather events isn't going to change their minds. So, um, you know, in some ways a provocative quote, but I think, you know, really, really important to highlight that um, just providing more science information alone, critically important, critically important that we advance the science. But in terms of actual um, sort of impact on the debate, on sort of public perceptions of risk management, um, climate science is just one of the, one of the components um, from a research perspective. Um, I'll circle back to, to some of the implications of that. Um, another uh, quote here from a leader in this space. Um, Members of the public with the highest degrees of science literacy are not the most concerned about climate change. Rather, they are the ones among whom cultural polarization is greatest. Um, another provocative um, quote, but I think backed up to a large extent um, by this next uh, slide, which hopefully everyone is seeing now. Um, basically just showing you by uh, party affiliation um, through, the, through the color of the lines on the y-axis, the probability um, that someone believes that um, climate change um, uh, is, is, is happening now and is, is mainly driven by human activities. So the biggest differences um, are really associated with, with, with political affiliation, but there's this other really interesting piece here. If we look at, again, with this sort of idea, if people had more information, had more training, how would it impact their perceptions? What you really see here is that more education um, depicted on the x-axis as we move from left to right doesn't get you towards a convergence. It actually gets you towards more polarization um, in terms of, of perception of how much of a problem uh, climate change is. Um, so that's especially the case if you, if you look at, say, the, the, the line for Democrats. Um, uh, but you also see it uh, for the others as well. Okay, going to the next slide, which is it frozen. Okay, 
um, seeing that animation now. Okay, so this gets to um, you know where I really want to go from here. You can make a fairly compelling case that people don't have maybe a big problem with the idea that uh, the science that explains why climate is changing. Um, obviously, many people don't have any problem with that science at all, but, but even among groups that may not be sort of moving on this issue, it isn't necessarily because um, uh, they question whether uh, climate change is, is happening and whether humans are responsible. Um, if we look by district at this next figure, this is quite interesting. Estimated percent of adults who think global warming is mostly caused by human activities. So what you can see here is that um, pretty much in any district in the country, um, um, even in some of the places where we, a lot of us might assume that the, the, the climate change issue isn't discussed quite as much or isn't thought of as being primarily driven by human activities, still in a lot of those, um, you know, argue in those places, you're seeing somewhere around 45% of the population, 40, 45% of the population, close to parity, um, accepting the idea that global warming is mostly caused by human activities. These numbers aren't really, really low. If you compare to other parts of the world, the numbers would be higher. If you compare to other parts of the U.S., the numbers are a lot higher. Um, but these aren't, you know, exceedingly low numbers. What's, what really jumps out is if we go to the next slide and ask about the percentage of adults who think global warming will harm them personally. This is where we start to see um, far lower numbers pretty much everywhere in the U.S. Um, should I just... Uh, Okay, yeah, hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, so what you're seeing here now is a lot of counties where, say, a fourth of the population, a third of the population only um, thinks that global warming will harm them personally. So I bring this up because I think it circles back to um, one of the important aspects of the, of the national climate assessment uh, and communication in general. Um, around communication. Um, and the slide that, that Catherine developed says the most dangerous myth we've bought into is that climate change is a distant issue only affecting future generations and places that are far away. So I think, you know, one of the things that this report has really tried to highlight um, is that that, that that perception is a myth. Actually, climate change is already here. Um, the risks of dangerous extreme events that, that, that impact human health asset value, um, and a variety of other factors, the ecosystems we care about, a lot of the statistics of those extreme events are already changing. Uh, we're already seeing um, some of these impacts. And while it may be true that a lot of the most devastating impacts could be in faraway places, we're also seeing devastating impacts um, close to home. Some of it's natural variability, but in some cases the statistics have already shifted. And as we move out into the future, a lot of those risks are, are going to increase. So I'll use the remaining time to delve into some more details about how this report um, uh, has highlighted uh, some, of those, some of those issues. Okay, so here is the, you know, the website, which I encourage everyone to visit if you haven't um, already, um, for the Climate Science Special Report. I want to, um, in one slide here, talk about a few of the key um, content aspects I'll highlight. Then we'll circle back and talk a little more about, uh, about the process behind the, behind the report. But what are the key findings and projections um, from this report? I think, you know, consistent with what I was just saying, um, to me, the, the central take-home message, which we as scientists have known for a long time, but probably have not highlighted to the extent that we should, is that small shifts in average conditions, I'm thinking here about things like the roughly two degrees Fahrenheit of warming that we've had, um, in the U.S. Uh, since 1900, <clears throat> or the roughly eight or nine inches of sea level rise that we've had over the last century or so. Small shifts in average conditions actually lead to large changes in extreme event frequency, duration, and intensity. This, again, is something we've known for a while, but um, for a variety of reasons, I think, hasn't been uh, successfully communicated. A little bit of an increase in, in uh, average temperatures means much more and more intense heat waves. A little increase in sea level means much more frequent and much more intense coastal flooding as, as two sort of central examples of that. And then I'll also want to talk a little bit um, about where the science is maybe a little more emerging, some things we really have uh, sort of discovered, if you will, um, in recent years that are highlighted in this assessment. Um, and specifically, um, for several critical systems, 
The balance of evidence is suggesting that these systems may be changing even faster than we thought, even faster than climate models, for example, uh, may have led us to led us to believe when we look at other sources of information. Okay, so before jumping into more of that, um, a quick kind of circle back to say a little more about the report. Uh, the most comprehensive and up-to-date ass assessment of the state of climate science in the world today. Roughly 500 pages. Uh, there, again, as I said earlier, 51 authors, um, most of them uh, from federal agencies, 12 federal agencies represented. Um, this report underwent extensive review, to say the least, um, five, arguably six review cycles. Um, and there was a 131-page uh, uh, review conducted by the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so extensively reviewed and, you know, <clears throat> as is always the case, um, the report uh, Im improved tremendously as a result of all that feedback. Um, so all that 500 pages or so can really be summarized um, in one sentence in a lot of ways. Climate change is real. We're primarily responsible. And it's serious. Um, this is going to have big impacts on, on us as a society and as individuals. Uh, and that the window of time to prevent widespread and dangerous impacts um, is closing fast. Carbon dioxide lasts so long in the atmosphere. Um, every decision we make to build a new coal power plant, for example, in many ways locks in um, future emissions and thereby future warming and, and future sea level rise. So um, to avoid those sort of most extreme uh, impacts, uh, action is required much sooner rather than, rather than later. Okay, um, now sort of circling back to highlight uh, a, a few of the more specific um, key findings. So I mentioned earlier, you know, temperatures have gone up roughly two degrees um, Fahrenheit in the U.S. That's already having a huge impact on the frequency of extreme heat versus the frequency um, of extreme cold events. Here you're looking at an average of something like 1,800 um, weather stations just in the U.S. And then what's being plotted here. Um, is for temperature, uh, the ratio in a given year of how many record-breaking high temperatures for that particular day at that particular station have been broken relative to the number of uh, extreme cold, uh, record-breaking cold um, for that same station. So you see through most of this record, um, a balance uh, actually in the early years, record-breaking cold was more common. That's depicted in blue. Um, but then as we shift towards these recent decades, the last two decades or so, you can see the statistics already shifting. Not only is the ratio um, tending to favor uh, more frequent extreme heat than cold, as depicted in red, but what also jumps out at you, of course, is how severe, how extreme that ratio has, has become as we get into uh, the more recent years. In one case, you know, seven times as many record-breaking hot extremes as record-breaking cold. Now, it's important to note that we're not claiming that it, this is all, you know, human activities, all climate change, especially when you look at individual years. There can be a lot of variability. But by the same token, look at this graph, and it's very clear to see that the statistics have already shifted. We can still get a year, clearly, with, you know, more record-breaking cold in the U.S. than record-breaking warm. That's happened as recently as um, you know, four years or so ago, three and four years ago. Um, but the statistics have shifted. If you're planning, if you're a public health professional, if you're an infrastructure manager, if you're thinking about energy demand, the climate statistics of the past um, are not going to be, you know, what you want to be planning for to have the most robust outcomes if your infrastructure or your decisions are based on, especially if they're based on, on long future time frames. So going to the next slide, just to quickly talk about changes in the statistics of another type of extreme here, um, precipitation. So climate models have suggested, and our basic physical understanding suggests that as temperatures go up, uh, we should see more heavy rain events. Um, but what we're finding, if we look at the observed data um, here over the last 50 years by different regions of the country, is that the heaviest rain events um, are actually becoming much more frequent, much more common, far more than what climate models would have suggested, especially over eastern parts of the country. If you look over the northeast, roughly a 50 percent uh, increase in the amount of rainfall having uh, on those really heavy rain days, or alternatively, you could think about it as um, the number of days that have really, really uh, heavy rainfall, both increasing um, dramatically, faster than climate models would suggest. And here again, we have to say that some component of this 
could be natural variability. You can't say that this is entirely due to human activities. Um, but by the same token, uh, all the evidence, um, including our basic physical understanding, suggests that human activities have shifted the statistics. If you're planning, again, for wastewater treatment, um, uh, drainage, uh, you know, uh, transportation, planning for the extreme precipitation events of the past um, is probably not going to be the most viable outcome as you, as you think about the future. Next graphic. Um, and again, the point that I made here that um, climate models seem to tend to underestimate these observed trends. Uh, they do underestimate the trends, um, although some of it could be due to natural variability. And that's especially the case for these really heavy rain events. Okay, a final um, example I want to give of these sort of basic uh, statistics of how things are changing. I mean, this one really points I think, to some of the transformative risks that um, are already emerging in some of our communities and that uh, we're going to be almost inevitably going to be hearing much more and more about, I think, in the not distant future. What you're seeing here is um, frequency um, in two different locations, Charleston um, top, San Francisco bottom. The frequency in terms of number of days per year of minor, minor flood events. So these are not, you know, this isn't Hurricane Sandy in New York. Um, this is what we call nuisance flooding, basically these high water levels that, you know, for some communities can mean um, uh, local roads are inaccessible, at least during high tide. Um, businesses in low-lying areas may have trouble operating, um, kind of things that maybe you can endure if they're happening a few times per year. Um, but what this plot is showing is that already, before we get to talking about the future, the frequency shown through these yellow bars of these types of quote-unquote minor flood events has changed dramatically. Look at Charleston there, um, events that were happening just a couple times per year, maybe a little more back in the 60s or so sort of already emerged to things that, that could be um, in the present climate happening something like 40 roughly days per year. It's non-negligible. But what really jumps out at you is when we look at um, uh, the future as sea levels continue to rise, even if we're on a trajectory where we get emissions um, to reduce relatively quickly, such as what's known as the RCP 4.5 scenario in terms of the future concentrations of greenhouse gases, we're still locked into these big increases in the frequency. So that by the time we get out towards later in the century, these events that you know, maybe used to happen you know, a few days per year could potentially see happening every other day. You know, at some point, you start to wonder um, whether our sort of mechanisms for, for, for dealing with these issues um, are sort of up to the challenge and whether um, you know, things that we may not think that much about today, like um, the ability, you know, the asset values, ability to underwrite bonds to protect some of these, these types of infrastructure could potentially um, uh, become less and less tenable in the future. And again, these plots make no assumptions about how storms will change. These are what we tend to think of as just sort of sunny day, clear sky flooding. Um, and these aren't extreme scenarios of sea level rise, um, you know, even just, just in the coming decades. We've already seen these, these, these trends towards more of these types of extremes and having them cause more damage when they happen, and that's projected to continue um, in the future. Again, small shifts in average conditions having a big impact on the frequency and intensity um, of, of extremes, whether it's the really rare extremes or the, or the sort of nuisance, um, more flooding type, more, more, more common types of extremes like nuisance flooding. Okay, now let's shift gears in the remaining time um, and talk a little bit um, about some of the more uh, cutting edge uh, findings, sort of where the science is newest, including some places where, frankly, um, all the results aren't in yet. Um, there's still, you know, a lot of key uncertainties, but where from a risk perspective, the consequences, should we see a big change um, in the system, are so large that you can make a risk management case and certainly in a sort of investment in science case that uh, we'd be justified in, in doing a lot more research, even though, um, you know, the verdict may not be totally in. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't have time to talk about all these. I'll talk a little bit um, about the idea that sea level rise could be increasing faster than we than thought when we did projections, say, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I won't have time to talk about uh, Arctic sea ice. I'll just quickly note here that the late summer sea ice in the Arctic has been decreasing much faster than climate models suggested. Uh, if we think about the... Um, uh, volume, the area times the thickness of Arctic sea ice um, in late summer, 
Um, it's dropped by close to 75%. The area has dropped by close to 50% over the last generation or two. That's far faster than climate models um, suggested. If you go back just 10 or 15 years ago, um, IPCC reports were saying we could have an ice-free uh, summer in the Arctic in 2100, if that. Um, now it's looking like that could happen far sooner. Maybe we can't even rule it out during the next decade or so. So that's a profound change. Um, talk a little bit about fire and drought and ocean acidification as well. So jumping forward in the interest of time, because I do want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, this is really this point about the potential for surprises. You know, climate models are our best tools, but they can't describe for us the full range of outcomes that, that could happen. And here's some text that, that sort of gets at that from various directions. While climate models incorporate important processes that can be well quantified, they don't include all processes that can contribute to feedbacks, compound extreme events, having multiple extreme events um, um, in different places at the same time, or sequence, sequences of extremes in one place, um, and abrupt or irreversible changes in key systems. Therefore, future changes outside the range projected by climate models can't be ruled out. Moreover, the systematic tendency of climate models to underestimate temperature change during warm paleoclimate analogs suggests that climate models are more likely to underestimate than overestimate the amount of long-term future change. So these are, you know, somewhat speculative statements. You know, we can't make definitive claims here, but again, the balance of evidence um, suggesting that it's more likely our models are underestimating how fast things could change than overestimating is, you know, additional argument um, and arguably the most compelling argument of all for, for dramatically reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a little more on specific surprises. Uh, this is a graphic showing some of the systems that could change. I mentioned Arctic sea ice. I'll talk a little bit about land-based ice in Greenland and West Antarctica, but those aren't, those aren't the only systems people talk about. The, coral reefs, um, uh, rainforests, as other areas that could potentially undergo um, uh, sort of state change um, where they would be undermined and, and in some cases potentially even disappear without a lot of warning. Uh, it's hard to quantify exactly where that threshold is, but that means we're, we're not sure how close we are to approaching it, potentially fairly close. Um, okay, so a few specific examples. Um, uh, uh, sea level rise and land-based ice. So sea level rise, as I said earlier, over the last century, about seven or eight inches. Um, some evidence of, uh, some suggestion of a little bit of acceleration in the last couple decades. Um, if we went back, say, 10 years or so ago, you were starting to see the first papers suggesting maybe we can't rule out a worst case scenario of six feet of sea level rise. Um, now, with this latest report, um, that, again, that worst case scenario, not what we're saying is, is most likely, but what might be described as worst case or near worst case, something that's very far out on that tail. Um, now we're saying eight feet can't be ruled out, physically possible, um, although the probability um, cannot currently be assessed and presumably is low. But again, if this were to happen, um, you know, think back to that slide of frequency of coastal flooding and, and you can see why this is an outcome that, you know, it's important for people to understand um, that there's a real risk of so that, so that the experts on impacts can start to assess, um, you know, what that would mean uh, for society. Uh, okay, another example that, you know, where, where, where we're seeing um, more emerging science interaction uh, in our coastal areas, especially our coastal waterways, but, but over the oceans as a whole as well. Uh, so they've been absorbing, you know, most of the heat that's been, been, been trapped through, through greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and a significant percentage of the carbon dioxide uh, as well. So the oceans are changing. They're warming. They are becoming more acidic. And another thing that we highlighted here is declines, declining oxygen concentration, um, especially in many coastal areas and not just at the surface. So what happens when you put together the temperature changes, the acidification, decreases in oxygen in many areas. Um, I don't think we know the answer to all those questions, but again, it's a profound change um, and something, you know, where we urgently, I think, need more research on the impacts um, side. Fire and drought, you know, something in the U.S. in this case that's, you know, clearly been getting so much attention lately, um, the situation in, 
and including an ongoing situation in, in California. So one of the you know, things that the report concluded is that really large fires are happening much more often than they did um, a few decades ago. There is emerging evidence suggesting that you know, the role of temperature is so critical. Uh, everybody thinks first, understandably, about precipitation. You know, drought is the absence of precipitation, right? It seems sort of laughably intuitive, but the role of temperature um, as an ingredient in drought and in fire is critically important as well. Um, if you have, just to give a couple examples, if you have temperatures that are just a little bit warmer in summer, just a couple degrees, which of course we've again had um, across the U.S., there's that much more potential for evaporation. You'd effectively need more rainfall just to maintain the soil moisture and sort of moisture balance in the vegetation that you had in the past. Higher temperatures generally lead to more um, evaporation. Furthermore, higher temperatures are changing the water cycle, um, especially in the mountain west. If it's that much warmer in winter, you're having less um, a smaller percentage of moisture falling as snow, which then sort of lasts into the dry season and gradually melts away, that snow reservoir. It's warmer in winter, you have more rain falling, um, and you're also going to have it with warmer, if it's warmer in spring as it has been, that snow reservoir melting earlier by the time you get to late summer, early fall, um, you know, bigger drought risk, um, uh, bigger fire risk. That's part of the story. Certainly for fire, there are many other parts of the story. Part of the story here has to be fire suppression practices in the West over the last century, um, leading to, you know, preventing small fires, leading to bigger fires now. You also have more people moving into what's been known as the WUI, this sort of wildlife urban interface, and potentially even, um, you know, humans uh, starting, a, you know, some higher percentage of these fires too. But again, there's a climate component here. Unpacking just how much it is remains a research question. But you know, we know we've had higher temperatures, um, and we know all things being equal, that that increases the fire risk potentially dramatically. Um, finally, I'll close with you know something more speculative, just to highlight that um, there are you know even as some things are so clear, um, you know there are some pieces that are still uh, more speculative. How will mid-latitude circulation, the jet stream over the U.S., for example, uh, change in the future? Is it already changing due to factors like loss of sea ice in the Arctic? I think the bottom line is, you know, we don't know. Um, but I think, you know, this potentially, if we, are to, if we were to see changes in the jet stream, you know, leading to, for example, in summer, more intense high-pressure systems, those ridges that give us long-term heat and drought um, outbreaks, um, even if we can't say for sure how that's going to change, um, it's an area worthy of further research um, and something that climate models potentially might not capture. So that, that's an example of something where I think much more research is needed, but you know, relative to five or ten years ago, we're seeing enough signs, enough cause for, for concern that maybe the jet stream you know, could be changing and, and some human activity could be responsible for that to say that uh, you know, this is an important area of further research and, and something to watch from a risk management perspective. So I think I should leave it there. Um, I've probably gone a little bit long, um, but hopefully we have some time for, for questions. Thank you. In, someone asked, in the nuisance flooding slide, is the trend line what we would expect without any warming? So without, uh, so that's a good question. I'm gonna go back to that as I take it. So I would say for, you know, most of the U.S., uh, the trend line you would expect just to be completely flat with no warming. However, it's important to note that there are a few parts um, of the U.S. that have been, that are basically due to factors dating back 20,000 years or more that are experiencing some natural subsidence or sinking of the land. For example, New York City, for example, has had about a foot of sea level rise um, since 1900 or so. About eight inches of that is climate change. Um, the remaining three or four inches you could think of as a natural subsidence process. Charleston, um, I think, would, so, so these, these other two locations, you basically, if there wasn't climate change, if there wasn't increases in greenhouse gases, you'd expect something very close to a flat line here. But there are a few places in the U.S. where some component of the signal is not climate change. But to directly answer the question, most places in the U.S., the baseline would be that this number would stay level as you moved, you know, it would just be parallel to the x-axis as you, as you move forward in time. 
Um, and then also a question about uh, the changing frequency of heavy precipitation events. Uh, the mm -hmm. question specifically was, what is the reference period for that changing frequency? So that's a good, important question. So on this graph, um, you can see that, hopefully everyone can see this, this is a, about a 58-year um, time window. But the specific numbers you get here are fairly sensitive to the start year and end year that you included. If you shifted it by a couple of years, at 55% for the Northeast could decrease to 45%, go up to 60%. There's some sensitivity depending on what start years you choose. Um, but, but the overall you know, trend re remains the same. This particular plot is showing about, about 60 years uh, worth of data. And, and tell us again what those specific numbers in the circles mean here. Okay, so the way to think about this is, um, you know, for each weather station basically in the U.S., and here they're aggregated by, by regions, you can define a 99th percentile of precipitation. What that basically means is if you just sort of ranked all the days from wettest down to no rain, you're doing a cutoff at a threshold where you're capturing the top 1% the wettest days. Um, and what this particular figure I'm showing is I'm pretty sure is um, how much precipitation is associated with that top 1% of days um, and how that changes in the future. But as I said, you could either view this graph as how much the change in the amount of rainfall on the heavy rain days, or you could pick a certain threshold of heavy rain. Let's call it, you know, in one place it might be an inch or more of rain. And if you used an actual threshold of a certain amount of precip, such as an inch of rain, what you'd see over the east especially would be more days crossing that threshold as you move through time. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at one point a state change. Can you explain for everybody what you mean when you talk about a state change? Yeah, so what I was referring to there is basically the idea of a tipping point um, in a system, the idea that um, uh, over a long period of time, there may be sort of a preferred state, such as, for example, you know, having, having an extensive ice cover in the Arctic, uh, you know, sea ice cover on the ocean. Um, and that state is supported by the fact that once you have that white surface, once you have that sea ice, it's extremely effective at blocking, and reflecting back incoming uh, sunlight, that white surface. Um, which helps it stay cooler, which helps maintain ice. So that's a stable state right now in the climate system. But a, a state change, you know, one example would be if that sea ice were to get so reduced, uh, so thin, so compromised, that you were instead having a lot of sunlight absorbed by the ocean as it replaces that sea ice, um, uh, as the ocean absorbs that heat, um, that's a warming process, which would then enable more ice to melt, giving you more of a dark surface that allows more absorption of sunlight. You can imagine a state change, whereas where you could switch from something that we've, you know, had for thousands, tens of thousands of years of, you know, perennial sea ice cover could potentially switch to a system where every summer um, uh, you were going, you were going ice free. Um, that would be, that would be one example. Okay. So it's really a fundamental shift. Um, in a system, and it's especially a case where, you know, where it doesn't necessarily happen gradually, but a, a switch essentially um, uh, changes, and you have a dramatically uh, different system after. Great. So we have a couple questions here related to sea level rise. Um, one of them is regarding the estimates. Um, Alan Best says, I've seen estimates of 20 feet of sea level rise if both Greenland and the Antarctic ice were to melt. Um, and you use the figure of eight feet, but relative only to the West Antarctic. So can you provide, shed some light on the, the 20 foot estimate? Like where does the eight foot fall into this bigger range we've heard? Yeah, and so I probably, you know, if I had more time, I should have been a little clearer about that. So the eight foot estimate, you know, is based on, again, first of all, it's a near worst case scenario. So we shouldn't necessarily, we shouldn't expect that by 2100, although, you know, sea level rise doesn't end at 2100. We might, you know, get that get that at some point later. But uh, I would say that some of the latest data out of West Antarctica is informing our concern about that um, about that worst case scenario. But it wouldn't be fair to say West Antarctica is the only driver for 
eight feet of sea level rise or the increase in, in our worst case sea level rise projections from six feet to eight feet. It's more, I was using it more of a sort of emblematic example because there has been some really important research about what we call ice cliff instability in parts of West Antarctica, aware that the sort of the edges of, the, of these giant cliffs could shear off into the ocean, for example. More generally, um, you know, while it's true that you could get 20 feet of sea level rise, even 40 feet of sea level rise if Greenland and West Antarctica were to go entirely in terms of their sea ice, nobody, um, you know, to my mind, no one, you know, from a credible per perspective is arguing that that could happen this century. So I think that's important to keep in mind. That's the amount of ice that you have in Greenland and West Antarctica, you know, the potential for, you know, something like 40 feet um, of sea level rise combined. But um, I, I don't, I don't currently think there's a risk of all that going by, by 2100 or even the majority of it. But the key point is if even just a small amount of it you know, goes, if you were to lose 10%, um, as we saw from that slide showing the coastal flood frequencies, you profoundly change the flood risk. And of course, you know, if we think about the effects of individual hurricanes too, that one in a hundred year storm for a given city that might currently you know, lead to two, 10 feet of, uh, of inundation. If you have another four, six feet of sea level, four, six feet of sea level rise, now suddenly you're getting an additional five feet of inundation. So it's more area flooded, um, more wave action. Um, you know, that's the source of the risk. So um, I think there are multiple sources of sea level rise. There's ocean warming uh, and then what we call thermal expansion causing the ocean to stand taller. Um, and then there's the you know, loss of these land-based ice sheets, which probably we should really be thinking about is some portion from Greenland, some from West Antarctica. And as we get further out in the century, um, certainly some from East Antarctica seems, um, you know, more and more plausible and maybe even, even expected. Uh, but I don't think people should worry about 20 feet of sea level rise this century, personally. But I also think that far less sea level rise, than, I know far less sea level rise than that um, can, can be a, will be a huge problem. Is there anything in the report regarding um, changes in ocean, ocean circulation patterns because of warming? There is. Um, this, again, is, I'd say, a place where, um, you know, we don't have sort of the definitive uh, results yet. But, you know, some of the things, some of the examples that are talked about in the report are from a paleoclimate perspective, when we look at history, again, talking about these sort of state changes, the idea that there have been periods when um, uh, the North Atlantic um, thermohaline, when the thermohaline circulation has changed, um, there have been periods where you had a century two or longer where we shifted from much warmer or much cooler conditions or vice versa over the North Atlantic. So as we look at history, we do see signs that things can change um, pretty quickly. And then going forward, the report talks about how if, as most climate models suggest, we do see more fresh water um, in the northern parts of the North Atlantic Ocean, more fresh water due to projections of more rainfall, and due to the idea that there will be more of this ice melting, um, Arctic sea ice, but especially some of that land-based ice, there's, I'd say, growing concern um, that we could have what's called sort of a freshwater cap or a partial freshwater cap um, in parts of the upper ocean there that right now are key to these sinking um, circulations um, in the North Atlantic that help, that are one component that then helps um, the Gulf Stream make its way um, uh, north, um, bringing heat to, to high latitudes. So the balance of evidence, I would say, um, especially as we look at climate model projections, suggests that that circulation, uh, thermohaline circulation, could, maybe even probably will, weaken a little bit. It's not a sure thing, but most models point to it. question is how much um, will it weaken. But that circulation system based on currently on cold, very salty water um, sinking in a few spots in the high North Atlantic. If we get more fresh water up there due to rainfall, due to melting of ice, that could make it harder for uh, water to sink there, which could then um, have an impact on the strength of the Gulf Stream. So that's something to watch. Balance of evidence suggests it will decrease a little bit. Um, okay, so I think we'll end with a couple of communication questions since you started that you started your talk that way. Um, so one of the questions comes from a journalist who asks, what, is, what are the most important points that you feel should be communicated by the press related 
to this report. And then the second um, comes from someone who says, you know, I've often had a lot of challenging conversations with people who um, don't think that humans are causing climate change. And that person asks, what do you think is your most effective elevator pitch, if you will, for communicating the evidence of, of human-caused climate change? Great questions. Um, sorry, I'm a little far. Would you just do, remind me just of the key, key aspects to the first question again? The first one was just, what do you think journalists should be reporting on related to this report and, and its findings, important yeah. um, info regarding climate change? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, this report has gone further than um, uh, some of the others in terms of highlighting the extreme events uh, of the types I talked about. Many are already changing in terms of their frequency and intensity, and we expect that to continue in the future. I think that, the, you know, phase two of the national climate assessment um, due out uh, in the not too distant future will do uh, more to highlight what the impacts are of those extremes. So I think focusing on extreme weather events, um, you know, is a way to really highlight um, for society this growing risk. And I think it's in a way that, that people can identify with. You know, extreme, a lot of these extreme events have a way of cutting across all aspects of society. If you're focused on ecosystems, you know, extreme weather events matter. If you're focused on human health, if you're focused on national security, if you're focused on the economy, if you're focused on, you know, prudent investments and business strategy, you know, everyone um, uh, can intuitively understand how extreme weather events um, expose our society to, to risk. So I think articulating how those um, extreme weather risks are changing is, is compelling. And I think just maybe more of a kind of observation, um, I'm not sort of maybe defer to the journalists on, on whether this is something to highlight. If we go back to sort of some of the key messages from earlier assessments, it tended to be something like this. If we emit a lot of greenhouse gases in the future, we'll get this much warming, maybe say five degrees of warming. If we emit a smaller amount of greenhouse gases, maybe we only get two degrees of warming. Um, scientifically, you know, accurate to, our, to, to the best of our current understanding, um, but arguably not as compelling as, you know, A, sort of highlighting how extreme event risk could change. But subtly, I think in this report, the other thing we do is acknowledge some of the uncertainties that we have here. So maybe the message is, you know, when we think about if we're on this extreme emissions trajectory versus a lower emissions trajectory, maybe the message becomes more the further we push the system, the further, the more greenhouse gases we emit, the more warming that we cause as a result, the greater the risk of some of these catastrophic outcomes or outcomes in general that are very hard to predict. You know, our models are based to some extent on what we've experienced in the past. But if we look at that long-term paleoclimate record, we do see these state changes, we see these larger changes. Given that we're observing some systems appearing to change quickly, the message I think more becomes, it's not so much if we emit a lot, this is how much warming we'll get, it's if we emit a lot, the risk of, you know, real game changers that are hard to predict, hard to adapt to, increases dramatically, even though we can't tell you exactly how much that, that risk goes up. So that's arguably, I'd say, a a somewhat fresh, if, if complicated, um, message. How, what would you say briefly to someone who right. doesn't think that humans have um, an appreciable impact on the climate? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's a few angles to take here. I think it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that there, there are uncertainties. Um, and we're probably never going to be in a situation where we can 100% rule out um, the idea that we could get lucky and be sort of bailed out in some sense by some total surprise. There's no evidence for it that clouds could change in some way that, you know, cancels out, um, you know, the effect of greenhouse gases completely. But we're never going to be able to say 100%. It's a risk management question, and we're seeing overwhelming evidence um, that these risks are changing. So you can, you can engage with people about decisions they make under uncertainty today. Economists plan for the future, um, even though they know that you know, the assumptions they're making about population growth, economic growth, um, you know, don't capture the full range of outcomes. So I think it's that risk framing, acknowledging uncertainties, but talking about the potential consequences um, um, is a critical area. And then also engaging, you know, beyond the science in some ways, acknowledging that 
um, with people, we live in societies, you know, there's a lot of motivations people have to care or not care about climate change that aren't related to the science. If your neighbors, for whatever reason, you know, think climate change is a hoax, is silly, it's the truth of the matter is it takes a lot of courage um, uh, to sort of step out of that uh, to really question. So I think that's, you know, just another example of one of the ways to, to engage with people around the sociology uh, psychology of, uh, of climate. We need a much richer discussion uh, where climate scientists are just one of many, many voices as we as we address um, all these issues, in, including a lot of the opportunities associated with reducing greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's um, you know investments in renewables, whether it's um, you know the investors who um, you know, push folks to to really engage around and face these climate risks. Um, there are probably huge opportunities, including huge opportunities to reduce vulnerability, you know, fundamentally.